it will not only be immoral, it will be suicidal. On today's World Insight with Ken Wei, struggling for a consensus, climate change once a global effort, now divided agenda, what's next? And in today's edition of Witness to History, for China's reform and opening up, Chinese economist Li Daokui on the speed and breadth of reform amid a complex global backdrop. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. The latest UN climate talks in Poland were set to wrap up on Friday, but delegates were apparently struggling still to come up to an agreement. The meeting could go on until at least Saturday, and ministers were working to come up with a common rule book to deliver on their promises in the landmark 2015 Paris Accord. Take a look. To avert catastrophic climate change, delegates from 196 nations gathered in the Polish coal mining town of Katowice to come up with a rule book to carry out promises made in the Paris Agreement. To waste this opportunity in Katowice would compromise our last best chance to stop runaway climate change. It would not only be immoral, it would be suicidal. For the past two weeks, the 24th Conference of Parties to the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has had disputes. Truly, but sadly, the prosperity enjoyed by a few developed countries has become the tragedy and mystery of the mess in the developing countries. Protests. And pleads. We are not prepared to die. And the Maldives has no intention of dying. We are not going to become the first victims of the climate crisis. Almost everyone agrees that global temperature rise needs to be limited, but they can't agree on how to cut carbon how much should each country pay, and how to monitor each other's actions. The world has warmed about one degree Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. Yes, another climate uh, report and more bad news. A newly released government report is revealing the dire, 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 dire consequences of climate change. A report published by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in October concluded that one and a half degrees Celsius is the cap, and to achieve that, Carbon dioxide emissions must drop by nearly half within 12 years. The UN climate body tried to give official recognition to the IPCC report, but the motion was rejected by four major fossil fuel producing countries, the United States, Kuwait, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. The latest data show that many large emitters aren't on track to meet their own self-imposed target, and the world is on pace to heat up around 3 degrees Celsius in this century. For more on the UN climate change talks, we are joined in our Beijing studio. Uh, Shen Yi Yang, who is a senior energy consultant with Asia Development Bank. Welcome, sir. Also joining us in Beijing, Zhang Jian Yu, the chief representative of the Environmental Defense Fund China program. Welcome as well. In okay. Katowice, Poland, we are joined by Jennifer Morgan, the executive director of Greenpeace International. Last but not least, in London, we invited Isabel Hilton. CEO and editor of ChinaDialogue.net. I want to welcome the four of you to be with us. Uh, in Katowice, uh, sure, uh, you know very well, uh, Ms. Morgan, the fight is still going on, but the question really is, with the current level of discussion, whether the issue of climate change is still strategically a common ground for countries that used to sign up to the Paris Accord back in 2015? I think it is, yes. I think it is common ground uh, by all the parties here, perhaps except the Trump administration, that climate change is a major issue. It is a problem that requires international cooperation. 
and from many countries here that no, much more needs to be done. Uh, that the science is clear, the pathway is clear, but actually it's the political economy that's what's holding back countries right. in many places. The political economy does matter though, I have to say, Ms. Hilton. Uh, if you think about from 1.5 degree now to 2 degrees, but still disputes going on about the theory, the facts, the so-called truth. Uh, so you see that so-called dogfight going on all the time without really concentrating on the real measures of implementation. What's next? Well, I, I, I would slightly take issue with you about the dispute about the facts. Mm. I mean, there are very minority interests that are pushing back against the science, but, but I really don't think the science is, is in serious dispute. What you have got, going back to the political economy, you have people uh, and interests that, that really do stand to lose and they are staging a kind of last ditch stand, like the group of countries that are oil producers that, that refuse to welcome the 1.5 degree report. This process always gets down to the hand-to-hand -hand combat level when you're talking about who does what and who pays. Right. And we're really, when you come to the rule book, that's what that's about. So it's fairly to be expected that, that this particular bit of the negotiations, rather than the kind of let's all sign up and have an ambition bit, which is celebratory, this is the nuts and bolts. And, and of course, it is very, very tricky. Mm. This is the hard work conference in a way. It's not the it sexy, is the hard work. Yeah. It's not the, uh, used to be the so-called sexy uh, conference, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. All glossy mm -hmm. and let's just celebrate the, the result. Uh, but it is really in the hard work that is actually where you're going to see whether there is going to be a real result or not. Right, Mr. Shun? Uh, well, I, I think so. Although there's still a lot of debate, you know, a uh, developed country, developing country. Right. Uh, but I think uh, the, the roadmap is there. And uh, I think compared with the, the previous conference, this conference will, will draw some, you know, uh, solid roadmap. Really? Well, if you look at the divisions there, or at least apparent division, I mean, people negotiate, right? And so they have to show their division, their stance before they come to an agreement. You got the small island countries, their fate is likely to be influenced by climate change 10 to 15 years. They could appear, they could still exist, or they just disappear. Uh, you also got the developing emerging economies who have been struggling with the developed economies as to whose responsibility it is that. And now they try to divide and the responsibilities while at the same time to play the role that they can. Then you have the developed economies which is divided between Europe, let's like just say, and the United States. Uh, uh, the Trump administration is no secret when it comes to whether they subscribe to it or not. So you got a lot of different interest groups, while well, at the same time within one group, there's also a lot of division. Many people wonder where is the consensus when it comes to real implementation. Mr. Shen, very briefly from you, since you're an economist here. Well, I think uh, uh, those differences exist for more than 10 years or even 20 years. So, um, but the, the key issue is uh, all the countries all agree to have some kind of, you know, actions. They have NAPA, the national action plans. Yes. They have roadmap. Uh, but now I think they somehow can, can have a kind of, as you mentioned, the common ground. So that means they will do something following what they have already agreed, Okay, right? Mr. Zhang here in Beijing too. I mean, it's not the first time that you and I are sitting <laughs> here talking about, oh, what is the roadmap and how to implement the roadmap. And therefore, let me come to you. How to implement the roadmap? This time, you see an easy way of doing it, given the apparent divisions going on. Well, I don't think there's an easy way out. I mean, you know, the basis really back to uh, 2015 when all the countries make up their mind for their INDCs. Yeah, but they could say, oh, wow, it's the previous administration, you know? Well, but I think And really, the world changing, they say. Right, 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 right. But I think really it comes down to the point is, I think this is a really good test for us, a hu for human beings, for the entire world. You know, clearly we're facing a problem, undisputable, you know, disasters well, happen. Well, you say undisputable, well, undisputable, the science, but there are the others who say, well, well it is disputable. Well, as uh, as uh, Jennifer just said, you know, uh, there are only four countries there opposing 
recognizing and the report. And they are the United States, for example. They are Saudi Arabia. They are Russia and some of the other countries. They are big economies, yeah. by the way. Right, but again, this is the common treasury of the commons, mm. right? It's just one common problem all the entire human being right. are facing. So where is the starting point when it comes to real implementation, Mr. Zhang? I have to be a little bit in a way, uh, squeeze you more uh, on the answer part. No, I think the answer is really in the, the leadership. I think the, in, in, in the Chinese language, you know, when we, you read the 19th Party Congress report, it said China is a, not only a participant, a contributor, but also is going to be a torchbearer in terms of climate action. But I think we should look for more of those torchbearers. It's clearly the United States is no longer the torchbearer. Mm. The United States is a spoiler of the game. But we should look for more of those torchbearers that really can carry on the mission, the errand, to the next step. You mean more countries and economy has to step out and say, I want to be a leader part in that implementation process, right? Right. I mean, this, I think this whole uh, CBDR mentality has been dogged us for really a okay. long time, common but differentiated. But now we're on the common ground of the Paris Agreement, and everybody, every country has their own commitment they already signed on. They just need to go and do it. Okay, go and do it, Ms. Hilton. As Mr. Zhang just simply put it, will the UK, where you come from, be a leader in just do it? Uh, which is, sounds like an advertisement for sports shoes, but you know, that's the spirit, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, will some of the other economies, France, Germany, be able to step out and say, let's just do it? Will they also work well, with I the think third the European country Union parties? is. Yes, sorry, go ahead. I think the European Union is, is doing it, actually. Yeah. The European Union is very comfortably within its targets, and, and it is showing signs, despite all the political problems that Europe has at the moment and Britain has at the moment, it, it, there are very strong declarations of, of you know, the intention to ramp up the ambition. So I don't think that that is a big problem. And actually, if you look around developing countries, there are all sorts of examples of countries that are within their own um, capacity mm. showing real leadership. So I don't think we should be too gloomy. And I don't think we should allow the Trump effect, which is certainly very depressing, but I don't think we should allow it to, to divert mm. us from the fact that real progress is being made. Mm. Of course, there is an, there, there is an effect with, with Trump because he gives yes. cover to other countries that, that have always been reluctant or slow. But that, I don't think, has changed anybody's mind about, about the fact that we really do need to do this and we need to figure out the actions at this point. Well, that's exactly the but question, it's isn't it? The action itself. Uh, Ms. Morgan, quite, I mean... Quite the contrary, actually, if I may come in. Please, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the Trump effect has actually galvanized more action and more unity. If you look in the United States at what is happening um, as far as states and cities and companies that have all come together and are imp working to implement the agreement, if you look at the G20, again, you had 19 against one on climate change. But I think, you know, the point of needing uh, more leadership, but, you know, it isn't an either or on the economy or the environment anymore. The IPCC is very clear that the things that are the best. <coughs> to stay, keep warming below 1.5 degrees, energy efficiency, renewable energy, circular economy, mm. all of those things are the things that are good for development. So I think that's where it's not this either or debate anymore. It's actually smart to go in this direction, both to avoid the impacts which are already hitting and are hugely costly, and to be an innovative based you know, successful economy in the years to come. Miss mm. Morgan, as you may know very well, uh, when it comes to climate change, if back in 2015 and even earlier, it was being used as a way of looking at the future. Whether it is about the economy, how the economy should transform itself, where is the growing point, uh, where is the potential of economic growth for the world, uh, or it is about taking care of the environment, or when it comes to you know, the philosophy of how we coexist with the earth and how we work with one another. So the climate change issue was much bigger than a climate change issue alone, as you may well understand. But now, with the Trump administration clearly said that it won't, do not want to be part of it, there are more players coming out and suggest, by, suggest the same thing. So. The question really is whether the climate change issue will still be the topic 
and the way forward for the world. I think that is the bigger issue here. Technical issues might be able to work out, but a strategic topic vis-a-vis -vis a technical topic, there is huge difference. Ms. Morgan. Yeah, I think uh, very much so. It is about humanity. It is about it's about um, ecological civilization and I think the answer there is that it will stay in the center because climate change is happening because with just one degree of warming you are seeing the impacts whether it be the increased storms whether it be the droughts um, all around the world that is no longer to be avoided and I think the climate agreement in a way is a multilateral agreement that is working despite the fact that the Trump administration has stepped out of it for now, or not quite stepped out of it yet, but said that they're going to. They're still in uh, for, and, you know, it has to stay for three more, for three years. Mm -hmm. So actually until right after the U.S. election, that final decision will be made. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it, this, is the, this is the reality. There's nowhere to hide. It's not like the impacts are going to stop happening. At the same time, you have the, eco the economic developments occurring. And what it really means is that leaders have to take that long view. They have to look out to the zero uh, carbon economy in 2050 and then backcast and say, mm. okay, well, what, what does that mean for our cities? It means right. our cities need to have a strong mobility concept. That's around public transport and car sharing and mobility. That brings cleaner air. What does that mean for our electricity? Right. And you know, what does that mean for what kind of cars you want to drive? And that's an opportunity, actually, to have that kind of transition that needs to be socially just as well, of course, but um, that frame is actually, I think, the frame of the coming years, uh, whether countries like it or not. It's okay. In reality. At the climate conference this time, Xi Zhenhua, China's special representative on climate change affairs, said some countries have failed to understand and carried out the Paris Accord. He said it was unrealistic and groundless for advanced economies to ask developing countries for more concessions when they have yet to meet their own targets. Take a listen. The Commission should fulfill its promise to provide 100 billion U.S. dollars per year to developing countries before 2020 as soon as possible. The goal is to establish a solid foundation of mutual trust between different parties after 2020. All right, that's coming from Xie Zhenhua, special representative from China on climate change. Mr. Zhang, uh, you work for an American NGO, but at the same time you are based here in China, so you in a way have to understand both sides of the story or even more. How should we understand this? That the climate change issue once was already a time that it seems developing and developed economies are already coming together about consensus. But now with the conference going on, we see even more divisions happening right now. Given the geopolitics that we are having also over the past few months, how should we understand this very complex backdrop? Well, first I want to clarify, you know, we're a global NGO just happened to be registered go. in the U.S., All but right. also we're legally operating here in China Absolutely. and contributing to the global commonwealth. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I actually, I would disagree with you. I think uh, it's no longer a geopolitical issue. I would argue because of the IPC report, which has recognized that basically the disaster is happening in front of us, in front of the whole human being. The human being probably has never had this challenge before in our entire history of development. Twelve years, that's what IPCC put. We only have 12 years to act. So your point about developing country and developed economies is? Well, people have already signed to the Paris Accord. People have their INDC. They have their right. target commitment. Just, again, my point is just go and do it. Fulfill your commitments. I think it's not, it's really, we don't really have time to all the debate on, you know, the division of labor, all that kind of stuff, just because that's the whole spirit of IDC. But, but the question is that there are certain parties that have not fulfilled mm -hmm. the uh, agreement or their early agreed the target, and they are pointing their fingers to the others and say, right, right. well, let's do, let you guys do more because you are now rising, you are now spending, and you are now uh, consuming. Right, I know, I know. But, but again, I think the dynamics change. I think the dynamics change is that those who are going to suffer from not action is, going to, is actually going to override those who are not acting to this. Look at China, you know, we heard all the stories about China. Al Gore just recognized China is one of those countries who really have religiously fulfilled its commitment under the Paris Agreement. China has developed 50 megawatts of solar power, being the leader. Why? Because China is really trying to, trying to act 
fulfill its commitment, right. but China is actually benefit from all the actions taking. But Mr. Shen, this is a global issue, right? It's not just one China that going to take the action and solve the problem. Everybody has to do their share. The question is now, even promised with the share, some are not necessarily fulfilling it. That is the issue here. And that kind of bad ambience can be contagious when economies try to escape their responsibilities, particularly at a difficult time. That is the issue here, Mr. Zhang. Mr. Shen, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, uh, when we're taking a look of uh, uh, like uh, United States, uh, sometimes the government is uh, not the only stakeholder. So there are also uh, different states, uh, private sector. So I think uh, the private sector will do a lot uh, or more than we can expect in the future to combat the, the climate change, especially on the uh, beautification part. So uh, we can see that in across Europe and also even Africa. So a lot of uh, renewable energy projects being set up, uh, even through South South Corporation, you know. So and uh, in addition, those uh, kind of uh, triangular cooperation, that means the developed country, developing country, and those you know emerging developing countries, they can work together. And the private sector now is doing more and more. Right. I think take a more uh, you know more important role than before. I mm. think. Ms. Hilton, what about your thought? If one exception is being created, there's likely to be more exceptions, as some would suspect. Well, they will try, but but uh, but again, I wouldn't lose sight of the fact, um, as as has just been said, that you know the Trump administration is not the whole of the United States. No. And on the, on the question of finance, I mean, I, I'm, I, of course the money is important and developing countries have a right to expect that that money is delivered. But when those goals were set, the difference between developing with renewable energy and developing with, with high emitting energy was much greater than it is now. It, it used to be, you know, far more expensive to I imagine a future powered by renewables. That is no longer the case, largely thanks to China and its manufacturing capacity and just the fact that these technologies are getting cheaper and better all the time. So these choices are not, again, they're not black and white. They're not unaffordable renewable energy and so-called cheap uh, high, high emitting energy. It, it's, it's not like that. And if you look at the other goals of the, of the United Nations, like the Sustainable Development Goals, mm. all of those align with a low carbon uh, future and and it's not the case that this is unaffordable anymore. Right. Not only that, it seems that there are some new platforms. For example, Belt and Road Initiative, which is uh, started by China, but at the same time, it's about a platform with partners joining in from all over the world. Mr. Zhang, uh, how will climate change issues, uh, environmental issues, be linked and implemented throughout the implementation? or future experiments of this uh, uh, platform, it's always an interesting question and that takes all parties to be involved. Yeah, I, I think certainly the, the challenge will be on, on both ends. I mean, the Belt and Road Initiative could be really a disaster if it's not managed well environmentally, right. but also could be a really propelled, a better environmental behavior if China, for example, again, acting as a leader here, trying to uh, transfer and trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, sh showcase and, and, you know, demonstrate the good uh, experience China has already accumulated throughout the 40 years of openness policy. China has been there. China knows what it takes. Mm -hmm. Now, through the development of Belt and Road, if green could be, again, the leading voice, the leading force there, I think it's going to be the biggest success of the history of sustainable development, rather be a disaster. Miss mm. Morgan, your thought? <coughs> Yeah, thank you. And I'm afraid I need to run to the negotiations are on okay. here. But I, I think this is an incredibly important moment, actually, for um, greening the Belt and Road Initiative because I think it's an opportunity for China to really bring the technologies that it has developed into other countries in partnership. And I think that leadership and uh, torch-bearing role is both a domestic uh, kind of what China does domestically and all of the work it's doing there, but it's also how 
it promotes green development mm. in other countries. And so I think that's something that is a big discussion here um, as well with people looking and seeing, okay, which direction is it going? And is it all, all are all the dots being connected? But I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave go you ahead. now and go and Wish you a good, uh, successful thank negotiation. You thank you so much for good being luck. with us. Uh, good, good luck. All the best. <laughs> and let me go to Ms. Hilton also on some of your thoughts. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. I, well, I, I agree with, with what's been said about the Belt and Road, but I would just add that right now, it, I, I think we're not quite seeing the leadership that we're all hoping we will see, uh, because China continues to build new coal-fired power stations uh, along the Belt and Road. Now, we said earlier that we have 12 years to bend the emissions curve. Normally, you would expect a coal-fired power station to last 40 years. All right. This is really not a good idea at this point. And China has become a leader in renewable technologies. And I, I simply uh, ask, really, and warmly suggest, that China export those technologies and not the technologies that, that it's trying at home okay. to navigate out of. It makes no sense. All right. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Shen here to respond uh, very briefly because we're running out of time. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the situation is changing. So I personally myself is participating in a Uni uh, United Nations program, UNDP program called uh, South-South Renewable Energy Technology Transfer from China to Africa. So we can see that a lot of investment together with technology transfer is now moving to a lot of less developing countries. So I think this is a really a good signal. Uh, in addition, China is promoting the green finance for this one build, right. one road, you know, initiative. I uh, personally, I believe in the next 10 years, we will see big change uh, in the kind of uh, green investment mm. along the Belt and Road. Very interesting discussion. For now, I want to thank the four of you earlier with Jennifer Morgan, and now the three of you, uh, uh, Shen Yang, Zhang Jian, Yu, last but not least, uh, Isabel Hilton. Thank you so much for being with us. Stay with us here on World Insights, still to come on the program. On today's edition, witness to history to mark China's reform and opening up, Chinese economist Li Daokui on the speed and breadth of reforms amid a complex global backdrop. Catch that interview right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. This week, we bring you our special series, Witness to History, featuring insiders who took part in China's reform and opening up. Today, let's meet Li Daokui, one of the best-known Chinese economists in the world. A meeting of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee was held in Beijing on Thursday. Topping the agenda was work on the economy for the year 2019. Senior party officials agreed the country should pursue progress with an eye on stability and press ahead with high quality development. China's economy has maintained a stable growth this year, but challenges persist. In November alone, for example, foreign direct investment, FDI, fell by 26 percent, while China and the U.S. are trying to fix trade frictions. As Professor Li told me earlier, in the past four decades, China's reform and opening up did wonders for the country and the economy, but now it is headed for deep waters. Take a listen. There has been different views about reforms. Mm -hmm. Some say it's not necessarily in the speed to the satisfaction of most. Others say, well, there has to be a steady growth of these policies and steady implementations of these policies. What do you think, Professor? Let's compare China's reform to the construction of a building. Mm. Right? After 40 years of construction, this building is already pretty much having taken its shape. However, the internal decoration that re now requires very detailed work, painstaking details, are now the task of reforms. So therefore, the reforms today seem to be slower mm. than it was 
40 years ago or 30 years ago because the nature of the progress of the construction of this house of the modern economy in China. So I wouldn't necessarily say that China is lacking commitment to reform or reform slows down. Rather, every piece of reform in mm. China today involves more thinking, more debates, more deliberation, more research mm. than before. The so-called deep water. Exactly. And I call it detailed painting. Mm. What do you mean by that from an economic uh, scholar's perspective? In economic terms, I do believe that the reform in, in the financial sector will speed, up, will speed up. For example, the structure of financial regulation right. will be uh, consolidated. Even though I do not know the details, but I'm pretty comfortable in predicting that, that the whole regu regulatory structure mm. will be consolidated, will be streamlined, will be strengthened. Some of the local numbers when it comes to GDP have been cooked for years and therefore people put a question mark about China's exact growth rate. What about the picture now? Local enterprises are now given different sets of incentives. Before, they were pretty much um, simply motivated to, to have GDP, to, to have economic growth, to have faster GDP growth. Mm. Now they are given a multi-task, multi-dimensional task. task. Uh, not only economic growth, uh, but more important, the, li the increase in living standard, mm -hmm. the improvement of the environment, and uh, R&D, uh, so on and so forth. So I do believe that the local leaders are now very different. Mm -hmm. I've been traveling around in China I've s in recent months. Mm -hmm. I've seen tremendous change, tremendous change in the mentality of local officials. Give me an example, Professor. For example, I just came from a big, big uh, city in the province of Shandong mm -hmm. with a population almost 10 million. 10 million, okay? It's not the capital of Shandong, but it's one of the largest cities in Shandong. Right. And the mayor uh, who invited me to go there, mm -hmm. he uh, spends lots of energy and his uh, time to one topic. He's been also asking me about this topic, how to change the engine mm. of economic growth from simply making investments mm. in infrastructure to or real estate, to, to say the least. <laughs> to sustainable investments to prop up the local R&D. Mm. And also, he says, educated population. Therefore, the industry in the city will be able to upgrade. Mm. There has been concern whether countries, including China and others, there will be a rise of nationalism. So when you have pressure coming from outside, it's predictable nationalism would arise in the country. So how would that work eventually on the economic policies and on the way of reform? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If you look countries after countries in today's world, starting from the U.S., right, President Trump, don't you see that as nationalism? U.S. first, America first, right? As simple as that. But that has not been well received by the rest of the world, by the way, But Professor. domestically, domest the, the president elected by the U.S. population, right, by the U.S. voters, is in inward looking, nationalistic. Mm. The nationalism is the trend of today's world. The Chinese government, including Chinese, you know, represented by Chinese leaders, right, are always, always trying to balance nationalism with a global commitment. Mm -hmm. Right? When, when President Xi Jinping says the China dream, he also says the common destiny. Mm. The community of shared future for all. Exactly. He always has double two messages. The two messages are combined. Mm -hmm. That is, how to make China great again. It's through China being able to make more contribution to the rest of the world, unlike the past 500 years. In the past, past 500 years, not only China slowed down as a country in making progress, but also China slowed down as a country making contribution to the rest of the world. Mm. So today's message from China, I think, is super clear. Forty years of reform and China's opening up, right? You were a Chinese student, and then you went overseas. You studied there in the United States, became a professor, worked there, comfortable life. But then you thought there's something better and bigger to be done, and you came back. You t teach at Tsinghua University. You try to establish the first ever institution 
on a Chinese university campus between Chinese and foreign, uh, in a way, joint efforts. So you knew how it was like to be someone coming from outside, coming back, and also to be a reformer in this process. The big takeaway from this 40-year anniversary of the reform is very, very simple. That is, continue the process and let the process not only benefit the Chinese people, but also the rest of the world. Reform is a mentality. Truly, reform is mentality. Every day, in everything, I have to implement reform. For example, I've been teaching a course for 14 years, an undergraduate course. Every year, I have to innovate. And I told students, if I don't innovate, if I don't do reform, somebody will, who is much more eloquent, much more knowledgeable, much more, much better looking than myself, <laughs> will do I'm a not video. Sure what is this we'll we're talking about we'll do a video. We'll do a you know, video. We'll do the internet learning. No, who am I? I will, I will be replaced. So that's why in my teaching, especially recent years, I always, always do reform. So in my current teaching, I reverse it. I let students first, first present the teaching material. Mm -hmm. I give them the PPT beforehand and that make comments. That way, I believe I cannot be easily replaced. <laughs> so this is an example of reform. Not reform by artificial intelligence. Exactly. Reform is <laughs> mentality. I do believe that the, the reform as mentality is deeply, deeply rooted in China. But you also know the challenge of being a reformer. Of course. Because of course. you try to set up an institute on Tsinghua University campus, and it takes years. Yeah. And of course, you always encounter with challenges that could be part of the fun, you could argue, yeah. but at the same time, it is challenging. It's challenging because, number one, you have to be patient. Number two, you really, really, really have to think from the other people's perspective. You have to make sure potential losers are properly taken care of. Right? You can imagine, you might be a loser. Of, the, of any reform any process, reform. right? Do you feel, you feel very uncomfortable. So any successful reform uh, has to, right, has to overcome the uh, obstacles from the from the potential losers. And I, my belief is not to wipe them out. But Rather, they have, you have to find a way to make them comfortable. But is the baggage to too heavy? Well, reform that by definition is that we have a bigger pie. We have a bigger pie. We have a bigger, right, bigger economy, more efficiency. So we're, we should be able to afford to compensate the potential loser. Maybe it's a better word. Potential, potential uh, uh, Those interests are people, being right? challenged. That's mm. right. Mm. But how patient can you be? Do well, you need to be as a reformer? In China, we have a saying that uh, 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 being slow is not a problem. The problem is to stop, right? If you keep on moving, keep on, keep on moving, you eventually will get there. Some example in Beijing traffic. If in Beijing traffic in a crossroad, if you stop, you never go cross because it's so busy. There are, they are, they are bicycles, they are uh, passengers, they are right, pedestrians, they, they're always cutting our way, right? So what you do in Beijing's crossroads, if you, you have to gradually move, 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 right? Then people would yield to you. All right. You, if you run you too fast, you, you, you run too fast, you have accident. If if stand still, you never come across. Well, you ride a wonderful motorcycle in Beijing, so I would <laughs> believe you. <laughs> what That's you right. have just said. Yeah. Looking ahead, it's not going to be easy to say the least, the professor. And China will be in the water that it has never been before. So, what kind of mes mindset, professor? Do you think? What is the leadership? What are the common folks? Academics? in China, from your perspective, need to have? Number one. And hold it dear. Number one, a sense of uh, urgency, a, a sense of um, um, uh, crisis, maybe too strong word, mm. a sense of needs uh, of continued reform. Mm -hmm. right? That's very, very important. Number two, be global. Always keep in mind that China is big enough, huge enough, so anything Chinese essentially is global. Mm -hmm. So we also have to take foreigners or people in the rest of the world's interest into account. Mm -hmm. We have to understand their mentality, we have to understand their interest. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally I believe that China's growth 
China's continued progress will also benefit the rest of the world. Professor Li, it's always a great pleasure having you on our program. All the best. My <laughs> honor, my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insight CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see the Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.